Welcome, everybody. Um, so uh, let me start. Uh, first of all, what we uh, are trying to do in open air, among several other activities, is um, on the technical side, is to build uh, this open air resource graph. Uh, just to contextualize a little, the idea is uh, is uh, the one of materializing what we call the open science graph. So the open science graph is intended here as uh, uh, the, the 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 metadata graph that researchers are uh, every day building when they store uh, they deposit their scientific products their digital scientific products into repositories worldwide or into the publishers website uh, in the publishers repositories of course when they uh, have a paper accepted or when they deposit resource data somewhere or the software uh, and so on and when they do this they describe these objects with metadata which uh, most of the time unfortunately not always as we would like uh, they also um, specify links to other objects which are not necessarily stored in the same data source. So whenever we do this as researchers, we act like this, we are implicitly building this graph, what we call the open science graph. So we are interconnecting these objects. We're also interconnecting them with uh, real world entities. When we use an ORCID ID, for example, we are also specifying that an object is authored by uh, a given author, or um, we can uh, link them to uh, the research funding behind it or the funder behind it. So even if we deposit a single unit, a single product somewhere in our local repository, we are implicitly taking part in building this uh, use graph. So what OpenAir is trying to do is to collect all this metadata and links worldwide and materialize this graph. So the magic of this is once you, the graph is materialized, of course, you can uh, build several applications on top. So on the left side of this picture, you see uh, the uh, high level, so the view from the moon of the data model. Uh, of open air. So this is to just to let you know that we have this notion of product, which is a scientific product. So the results of a scientific process like research activities, which we classified into publications, namely literature. So objects that you read intended for uh, humans to be uh, uh, to, to read. Uh, research data, which are intended as the kind of objects that can be processed by uh, an algorithm, by a service, by a process in general. So they're intended for machines in general, although sometimes they can also be read, for example, in the XML, but that's the idea. Uh, software is uh, effectively code, so is uh, what you can uh, compile or interpret you know, to run your uh, program. So it's different from resource data and it's different from literature. And other resource products are those that do not fall into these three categories. So the kind of objects that you can find out there like workflows, protocols, uh, and many others, which are mainly community specific. So they have a naming and an understanding that is typical of a community. So we, what we try to do here is to come up with a model that would uh, at least uh, identify the entities that are common across different disciplines. So, so yeah, they have a common understanding across different disciplines. While in other research products, we tend to uh, place everything that at least uh, gives us a doubt. So of course, anytime we can try to dig in into the other research products and come up with another entity, which we believe to be uh, cross-discipline enough. Uh, we have experimented, for example, with virtual machines. That's another kind of uh, class, but we were not successful in the, in the sense that there are different namings and not so many stored out there to justify uh, an independent entity type. So for each product, as you notice, we also uh, keep track of the source which is the source where the product has been stored or the source from which we collected the metadata about the product. And then we have linked to projects. Projects are linked to uh, funding and funding streams in, in general and the funder. Give you an example, the funder being the commission, the funding being H2020 and the project being open air advance, for example. Then we have organizations. Organizations, as you can, as you can see, are linked to projects uh, because they are beneficiaries of projects and, uh, and grants, but they're also linked directly to products. So there's no author in between, okay? So uh, we are associating a product to the, an organization if um, an author of this product uh, affiliates, is affiliated to the organization. This is very useful for us for monitoring reasons. 
Community. Uh, communities are for us uh, a very abstract concept that in general we use to, uh, um, let's say, put together a number of objects which are somehow related with each other in terms of this notion of community. So the community can be something very discipline oriented. And in this case, we try to identify the, the chunk of the graph that is uh, related with this discipline. So for example, the projects related with, uh, uh, I don't know, with uh, European marine science, which we have, uh, together with all the publications, data, software, et cetera, that are related with it, together with all the sources that are working in this context and so on. But it can be something else. So for example, it can be an initiative of which you would like to measure the research impact. So we have such examples like EGI, EGI, European Grid Infrastructure. This is not identifying any discipline. In fact, there's a horizontal E infrastructure. And for them, we are identifying the sub part of the graph, uh, which is related with this initiative. Okay. And that's for research impact measurement. But how do we build this graph? First of all, we harvest. So it's really collecting metadata from these sources. We have around 10,000 sources from which we collect today. Secondly, we are also uh, um, uh, um, following another, uh, let's say another, I would say crosswalk uh, compared to the past. So we are looking into the research infrastructures, uh, which in Europe are, let's say, the uh, uh, electronic and networking uh, systems, so uh, made of people and services uh, that are used by a specific discipline to uh, realize uh, and perform everyday science okay so here we have a few examples and in this case we we try to dig into there because in several cases these uh, research infrastructure have services used by scientists to perform experiments they actually have digital objects but they don't store them right so they don't publish them so what we try to do is to um, catch these kind of services and bridge them to the uh, open air research graph in order for these objects to be revealed out to the world and be interlinked with the rest. And that's to uh, facilitate reproducibility, for example. So we may have um, the digital representation of an experiment linked to the input data, linked to the output data, which we actually assign a DOI thanks to the position to Zenodo and publish in the graph. And this was never done before. Okay, so that's step a step ahead with respect to the past so when we collect the metadata and this is in very uh, uh, original form uh, of course this is not enough to build a graph so the metadata has to be harmonized so towards a common understanding of format vocabularies and so on um, it needs to be duplicated because in several cases we collect the same metadata record so describing the same object from different sources and these metadata records are different one may be richer than the other, for example, uh, or may specify information in different languages and so on. Uh, then we perform a lot of mining. So the idea is that when we can, we collect also the PDFs behind and the, art, uh, the, the full text behind uh, the metadata record. We are collecting today around 12 million open access, uh, sometimes straight from the metadata records because the data source allows us to do so, sometimes thanks to face-to-face -to -face and bilateral agreements with the publishers, which provide us with uh, their mining so that we can return back information to them. And via mining, we actually uh, do, uh, we actually enrich a lot this graph. So we obtain metadata information and links between the records that are not provided anywhere out there. Uh, namely, links between projects and product, links between uh, products and products, like uh, publications linked to software, publications linked to research data, uh, or uh, links between products and communities and organizations and so on. So we tend to enrich. Uh, on top of this graph, then we offer a number of applications, but others can build their own added value right, applications. Uh, we build tools for monitoring, for example, research impact with respect to a funder, with respect to a community, with respect to an organization, uh, but we also offer services to share and interconnect for the resource communities. So the, the community point of view. Uh, so in order to identify the, um, the products and the, the research entities in general related with the community. Um, we also provide APIs through which you can download the graph, play with it and uh, possibly give us feedback, okay? 
the graph uh, will be used to offer uh, the scientific product catalog for the EOSC. So the idea is uh, that the EOSC will provide several, uh, of course, scientific product catalogs, but this one will be probably the broader and largest, okay, being cross-discipline. So what is the open resource graph? So it's about metadata. So we are collecting metadata and links between the metadata. Um, uh, so uh, namely the links between the objects described by such metadata. It's about scientific products. It, it contains information about open access. So when an object is open access, if not, or at which degree. It's linked to funding information and resource communities. And as you can see, these are the properties out there. So it's open, complete, the duplicated, transparent, participatory, decentralized, and trusted. Let me go through this one at a time. So first of all, it's open. We mean that we want to export it as uh, CC0 as much as possible. In some cases, it's not possible because, and we have to expose it at CC BY because some of the sources uh, imply that. So the metadata that we collect uh, uh, obeys to uh, stricter um, copyright. Uh, okay, complete. Complete because we try to uh, include in the graph all sources, these are just samples, uh, that we believe are trusted by the scientists. So try, scientists use them, use them to find information, use them to store information. If there is six, one of such sources, we want to have it in the graph, okay? Um, so examples here are from the open citations to the Microsoft Academics, Unpaywall, DataCite, Crossrefit as a whole, ORCID, for example, for research entities, uh, but we have many. So the thematic uh, repositories, uh, data sources from the research infrastructures, all publishers in general, especially if, not, if open access, aggregators, uh, GRID, for example, for the organizations, Retri data for uh, directory of sources and so on. Uh, when we collect it, we want it to be duplicated. So the logic behind it in simple terms is that when we find a set, a group of, of records that we believe are the same, and we do this by matching, of course, we want to merge them. So we obtain only one object out of them, and we preserve, of course, the provenance of all the objects that have contributed to this, okay? And uh, include all the information that we can obtain from these records. So we build a potentially richer record, thanks to the union of the information coming from the rest. Participatory, we want everybody who's willing to participate to the graph, so to offer the metadata, content providers, so they can come and uh, offer the metadata. We classify them uh, according to uh, a taxonomy, which I'm not going to describe here, but uh, you can access the graph also, uh, taking into account uh, if you want, for example, an institutional repository or a data repository or an aggregator of institutional repositories or whatever, okay. Transparent, we keep provenance, as I just mentioned, and we keep also uh, a level of, we call it trust, so reliability indicators. So every single record has information about where it comes from, if it can, if it's obtained from different sources, we have all of them. And uh, at the level of the fields, we know if this field has been inferred, for example, by a mining algorithm and when, and we have a level of trust. So for each field, we, uh, we claim also how confident we are about uh, the reliability of this field, based, of course, on double checking and a validation process of the algorithms, okay? And this is, uh, provided as a number between zero and one. So you can also view the graph potentially based on the level of uh, trust that you want to uh, assume to be minimal. Decentralized, that's another important thing. This, is, this graph is intended to be public good, okay? So we are building it today, but at some point, uh, hopefully not, but open air may uh, seize these activities. And in this case, the idea is from now to that moment to redistribute the content of the graph to the original sources. So we do this by exchanging information with other graph, uh, uh, similar graphs, similar to ours, but we also do it using brokering services. So a bro the broker service that we have is capable of given uh, a data source who's providing metadata to OpenAir is capable of returning to this metadata source the enriched part. So we, what we found in OpenAir that wasn't available at the original record. And the original data source can actually subscribe to special kinds of enrichments. For example, give me the DOIs that I don't have or give me the um, uh, open access URLs 
uh, versions that I don't have. Give me the links to the data sets that I don't have and so on. Give me the links to the projects, okay? These kind of subscriptions can be uh, uh, created in OpenAir and in return, OpenAir will uh, notify the uh, content provider administrator with uh, the list of enrichments at the level of the records, just to be clear. So for each record, we can tell you, uh, you can find this and this and this for you to enrich it, okay? Trusted. Uh, this is going on in this very moment. So we are becoming ORCID member. Uh, this means that uh, in next year, soon next year, hopefully, users will be able to, uh, well, today they can log in using their ORCID account, but they cannot visualize their uh, profile. Uh, we'll include ORCID profiles of users into OpenAir. This means that the model that you've seen before will include authors and especially ORCID authors. This, this will allow us to do uh, a number of things. First of all, uh, as an author, as an ORCID ID author, you'll be able to send uh, your documents, which you, be, you claim to be yours, your scientific products to your ORCID profiles. And here in the open air graph, you have a view of everything out there. So all the data, all the products, all the uh, uh, scientific products potentially assigned to you are there. So you have an o a global overview. Okay. Uh, the other important thing is that thanks to uh, what we call the merge and the propagation techniques that I'll show you later, um, we can actually recommend a lot of uh, results, uh, scientific results, which are not uh, today in ORCID to the authors. Okay. So the authors can actually take advantage of this and enrich uh, their ORCID profile. And in doing this, they're actually double checking our work. So they can also tell us, no guys, you're wrong. So you uh, assume this uh, article is mine, the ORCID ID that is specified here is mine, but is wrong. So this will actually help us to build uh, more trust around the graph and more precision. Okay. So populating the graph. Um, the idea here is we harvest, okay, but we don't, we're not harvesting as we used to do and as many others uh, are doing today. Um, basically, the, the basic conditions under harvesting are typically assuming that all objects coming from a data source, uh, especially in the scholarly communication domain, are of a given type. For example, um, you collect from an institutional repository, so what you get are publications. Uh, you collect from Figshare, what you get is data, is data right? Um, you collect from GitHub and what you get is software. Uh, this is generally not true. So I would say the 100%, <laughs> no, but maybe very close to 100% of uh, the repositories out there or the archives uh, are hybrid. So we have several hybrid repositories, especially in the public domain. So when I collect from an institutional repository, I'm, I will likely find um, software, data, and other things, not only articles, okay? <coughs> so what we're doing in OpenAir, <coughs> sorry, is to uh, consider every single source as a hybrid, potentially hybrid source. So we do a fine grain classification. So when we collect an object, we know what's the original source, we know what's the resource type, and we try to map this resource type, given the original uh, data source uh, typology, into its specific class. So into a publication, a data set, or software. Uh, this is quite challenging, and we're improving it constantly. Uh, we have uh, a shared uh, mapping between ontologies, which we enrich every day, and we keep up to date every day. Uh, by analyzing the original metadata, for example, identifying the resource type we haven't yet mapped into uh, one of the meta classes, publications, data, software, etc., and keeping this um, uh, mapping up to date. Um, the other uh, and uh, uh, the, the other, let's say, methodology that we have put in place is the one that I mentioned in the first slides at the beginning. So, we are trying to uh, dig into the research infrastructures in the workflows, the experimental workflows they have that scientists use and try to uh, bridge their uh, services, so their thematic services, um, in order to make them seamlessly uh, publish into uh, uh, open air 
the uh, digital products they produce. So here is an example. On the left, you have a thematic service that takes a data set and a method plus parameters and produces a data set. Uh, today, most likely, the data sets will be published manually by the author if the data set is mature enough, if the author is happy, uh, the author will have to publish it somewhere in a, a data repository, I don't know, Figshare, and link it to the article, okay? Uh, in this, what we call a continuous publishing procedure, the thematic service has been modified in order to publish on behalf of the author uh, the whole experiment. So if the author is happy, uh, what is uh, the result, then by simply ticking an option. As a consequence of this, uh, the thematic service itself, we publish into Zenodo everything. So uh, a representation of the experiment, so um, a file that represents the experiment itself, so claims what the service is, which were the parameters, the time of execution, points to the input data set and method, if these are published, otherwise also these will be published and points to the result. And the result and the data set will be also published as an independent object with uh, an inverse link to the experiment object. In uh, some of the experimentations that we are performing with EPOS, for example, the uh, digital um, object representing the experiment can be actually fed back to the thematic service in order to re-execute the experiment. Okay, so the thematic service is also able to interpret this digital object and set itself in order to repeat the experiment because this is what they wanted to do. So if the thematic service does that on your behalf, of course, for the scientist, it's much simpler. Uh, the process is facilitated and the likelihood to have everything published out there for the repetition of the experiment is uh, bigger. And of course, once we publish in Zenodo, Zenodo is into the graph, the open air resource graph. So we will be visible from there. Okay, that's the experiment I just mentioned. Now, we're not collecting all sources uh, in the same way. Uh, and that's because some of them are huge and it does not make sense uh, to collect them and um, uh, include them in the graph uh, altogether. So we do a lot of pre-processing, especially on the side of links, article data set links, and uh, Crossref, because Crossref is the largest collection we have. Uh, these two collections are available today. Okay, we publish them every six months, uh, although this is a lie because uh, we didn't manage to publish every, every six months, but that's because, we, not because we don't want to, but because it's really, in some cases, uh, the deadlines and uh, the kind of activities we are doing, uh, it's really hard to uh, be up to the expectations, but new releases will be out soon, uh, this month. Uh, <coughs> Skull Explorer is basically, uh, the largest collection of authoritative links between articles and data set worldwide. So we are collecting data site, the whole data site, so links in there, links in the event data, which uh, are the ones coming from the publishers towards the data set, and links from Emboli BI. So we're collecting the whole collection of links and we are putting them together. Also the ones from OpenAir, because some of the links actually come from the repositories or from the mining that we have. So we have 400 million links, bilateral links. So it's 900 and whatever, 60, okay? Uh, so it's a lot of stuff. And this is of course an open service. So you can actually use the API to resolve links. So you can send to the API a DOI and get back uh, the list of objects linked to this DOI. Or you can send a PDB and get back uh, the list of uh, article DOIs linked to it. This is a service used today by uh, all publishers, most publishers, by Scopus, uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's um, the same, very useful for the business as well. And of course you can download the collection, okay, and play with it, do your experiments. DOI Boost instead is uh, the union of Crossref, Unpayable, Microsoft Academic Graphs and ORCID IDs and, and the uh, ORCID, okay. So the idea is we, that uh, we start from Crossref as a pivot collection and we attach to it all the open access version coming from Paywall, all the richer information coming from Microsoft Academics, for example, the subjects, the abstracts, uh, the affiliations, uh, the ORCID IDs, the Microsoft Academic IDs, 
etc. And from ORCID, we uh, attach the ORCID IDs to the Crossref. Okay, so since every ORCID ID has a list of publications, we basically build the inverted index. So for each publication, we build a list of ORCID IDs linked to it, and we merge it with Crossref, obtaining actually quite interesting results. Uh, we enrich, of course, Crossref, uh, the number of uh, ORCID IDs in Crossref, thanks to this process. Uh, we have around 85 million publication records, and that's due to the fact that some of the publications in Crossref are quite poor, so we exclude them from the processing. They're completely missing data, uh, dates, or authors, or sorts of stuff. Context propagation. Uh, so once we build a graph using the original metadata that I just mentioned to you, the original links, the original metadata records, the deduplication, and so on, we're not over yet. We're not finished because there are other interesting things that we can do. We can actually propagate in the graph information. Um, these are just three examples, okay? So for example, the top subgraph that you can see. If I have a project and I know that a, pro uh, and a product is funded by this project, then if the product is linked with a supplemented by relationship to another product, I can easily uh, uh, include the association to the project to the second product. For example, a publication linked to a data set. I know the publication is linked to a project. If the publication is supplemented by the data set, then the data set is associated to the project. And I can follow up with this kind of uh, conclusions also with organizations, for example, right? That's pretty easy, especially if I know if the authors are the same uh, between the, pro uh, the two products. Uh, I can propagate uh, the country. Uh, and that's another interesting perspective. I can actually tag every single product uh, with a country tag, and I can propagate this country tag, and therefore obtain implicitly an aggregation at the country level, okay? So the chunk of the graph that links all objects to the country. That's very interesting because it goes actually beyond the notion of national aggregators that we have today. So today, if you want to build a national aggregator, you collect content from the repositories, right? Uh, but there's much more beyond that. For example, in OpenAir, you can find uh, old products which are linked to uh, a national project, okay? These are implicitly associated to the country. And uh, through propagation, you can really broaden uh, the number um, of objects linked to uh, a country. Uh, the same you can do with ORCID IDs. You can propagate ORCID IDs. So uh, following the example on top, if you know that uh, a product is associated to a list of ORCID IDs and is linked to another product where the author names are the same, there's a probability is very high that the ORCID IDs can be propagated, especially if all names match uh, the uh, names of the first products, okay? And that's typical in the relationship between publications and data sets in many domains. Uh, the author set is often the same. Uh, so thanks to this context propagation mechanism and of course including a level of trust because uh, the trust is not the same whenever we do propagation, it lowers, it goes down, uh, we can uh, enrich the graph and make it uh, even more useful for the world. So today uh, you can see two graphs in open air. One is the uh, uh, one in production, which is under explore.openair.eu. Uh, and uh, this graph is uh, smaller than the one we have in beta. And that's because we are, we are showing, let's say, the open access subset of the graph. And um, this is due to the fact that open air, since uh, recently focused mainly on open access content acquisition policies. So we were quite strict on that. Uh, in beta, what you see are the open science content acquisition policies, uh, new ones published in Zenodo, if you want to take a look at them, it's a document. And therefore everything is included. So uh, the numbers are much higher because of that. And in order to access it, you have to go to beta.explore.openair.eu. Just add a beta dot in front and you obtain our beta services. Uh, we have a number of liaisons going on from, with Microsoft Research, with Unpayo, with Orchid, uh, we're becoming members and we also have several activities in RDA uh, where we are discussing how these graphs, so research graphs in general, knowledge graphs about research, uh, 
should interoperate in order to exchange information. Uh, we, we strongly believe in this. I mean, this is uh, the mission of OpenAir, right? So it's very important for this graph uh, to interoperate because behind each of these graphs, there, there are skills and knowledge uh, that can contribute to each other's missions, okay? Uh, it's not possible for one single initiative to uh, achieve uh, everything out there. So we need to cooperate. And I really believe that this is a very special season for scholarly communication because we are moving to uh, an open science framework. And since we are coming from, uh, uh, I think, dark a dark era where, uh, you know, the giants like the big publishers were basically dominating whatever we were doing, especially in terms of sharing scholarly communication, evaluating scholarly communication, I think today we have a chance to take it back in our hands, right? Uh, it's clear the fact that the same guys, the same big guys, <laughs> want to move over. So they're moving towards data, they're moving towards reproducibility. And I think we should, uh, we should not uh, make this happen, okay? So collaborate with these guys because they're still important, but uh, making sure that whatever uh, we produce belongs to us and making sure that we are the ones who should actually validate uh, what is valuable and what is not, okay? So these graphs are actually key for us, for the researchers, for the future of scholarly communication. And we should intend them as such, okay? So be patient and build them together, improve them together. Uh, this is why we uh, have now started uh, uh, an open consultation from the graph. Actually, it's November, we hope to be October. So <laughs> I had to update this slide. And you can find uh, in beta.explore.openair.eu a link to a Trello uh, installation um through the trial installation you'll be able to check several things on the one hand the roadmap so what is going to happen to the graph what is happening and what has happened to the graph so the kind of enrichment we're going to uh, um, and improvements we're going to uh, process in the near future and we are currently processing uh, on the right side instead as you can see you have ways to uh, provide your feedback so we thought of organizing this uh, in terms of the entities. So you have the publications, the data sets, the software, the other research products, the organizations, and so on, if you go to the right. And for each of them, you can give us uh, very detailed uh, feedback on what you found uh, wrong or as bad. And uh, this will help us at improving the graph and make it a better object for uh, our own good. So. For example, you can write a comment uh, on a specific activity here is metadata errors in publication metadata, okay? That's very, very important for all of us, okay? So thank you very much. Uh, my final remarks were the ones that I just mentioned. So <laughs> it's not because there's none, but <laughs> because I wanted to really recommend uh, that in general, as scientists, we should uh, uh, pursue uh, this uh, logic of sharing and transparency, okay? So we should not rely on these mechanisms that, are, that exist already or on new ones that publishers may provide. Okay, so thank you very much. So if you have any questions. Gwen? Paolo, I think there is a question in the question and answer box. Okay. So from yes. Washington, I can see, I can see one. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, that's a long story. Uh, that's a long story. Uh, so, they're, they're not there today. They will be soon. And that's because they, what you can find today uh, in terms of citation, because we have citations, are the citations that we have inferred from uh, the um, articles. So we mine the articles, we uh, identify the bibliography at the end of the articles, and we actually identify uh, the elements of the bibliography that have a match in our graph. So you will find a link 
from the bibliography to uh, the objects in our graph. But the, bi the bibliography is intended as, uh, let's say, a, um, as a property of the record. Okay, so these are not intended as relationships as the rest. So it's um, uh, it, it, it's, it's not integrated as a normal relationship and it cannot be browsed as such. These will become relationships very soon. And uh, uh, we provide these relationships to open citations and we'll include the relationships that we already have from open citations in the graph. Uh, today, you can find links to open citations uh, uh, in every single record. So in the, if, you, if you go to a record, you can find a link to the citations in open citations. Okay, in the next phase, we'll merge these contributions from uh, our friends of open citations, and we'll also include our contributions into theirs. So the graph, yes, will include everything that is uh, a citation and that is openly available. The question was regarding the links, products to product, is this in including citations? So that was my answer. Uh, we, we partly have them, but again, they're not represented as citations, but as properties. And uh, very soon we'll make sure they will become citations. You're welcome. Uh, any other question? Don't be shy. I'll be here anyway. So you know my name. And uh, OK, organizations, institutions as affiliations. OK. We, we have, uh, we, what we keep are links between products say a data set and the organizations of the authors of that product. This is a uh, key, for example, to measure the research impact of an organization. Okay, and that's the next step. Um, why do we do that? Uh, for several reasons. So why don't we include the author in the chain? Uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first one being that uh, metadata doesn't in general provide that. So data site does, but the majority of the metadata we collect from uh, regular repositories like institutional repositories, thematic repositories from the publishers does include that, okay? Uh, the second uh, aspect is also because via mining is pretty easy to find the, an organization in the header of a paper. It's harder to find the organizations linked to the author, links to the link to the, to the paper itself. So we decided to go for this in the beginning because it's uh, pragmatically very useful. And uh, across the different use cases, uh, it can be uh, acquired as a piece of information. Uh, The API already working for the beta version. Uh, I leave Alessia to reply that. Uh, I think we only have dumps, which are being increasingly produced. Uh, Alessia, do we have a beta API working? Uh, we have, um, yes, the OAI PMH um, API of beta, which are working. Uh, I'm not sure if we have added uh, the link in the documentation page for that. Uh, however, I would like to strongly suggest to use the, the dumps that are available on Zenodo because the graph is very huge. So um, I think it's better for, for developers and users to, to get the dump and work directly with the dump. Uh, yeah, but I will make sure that the link to the OAI PMH is, is available on the on the documentation page. 
And there's another question from Yadranka, which is, do you plan to link organizations with funders? Uh, well, funders are considered as organizations of a special kind. Uh, I'm not sure which kind of links you would like to refer to. You mean projects maybe, rather than funders. Um, So today, funders are linked to funding streams. And uh, of course, the funder, it, the commission itself is an organization. They have a jurisdiction. So we know they refer, for example, to a country or to Europe or to US. So we have 29 funders today. Uh, and for each of them, we collect the projects. And for each project of each funder, we try to mine into the publication to find the links. And we find, I think, around 400,000 links. Uh, so it's a lot of stuff in terms of um, uh, enriching uh, the original graph. This information is not available, of course, in the metadata, in the 90% of cases, 99% of cases. And uh, it's interesting also to, for example, to identify uh, double funding, well, quadruple funding, <laughs> tentuple funding, because it's we have cases where we have like six, six seven funders for one article and it's uh, quite interesting to investigate. Antonia Correa, uh, we use grid, we use grid identifiers but we go beyond. So uh, the, the problem, uh, of course I couldn't go into every single detail, but the problem is uh, quite challenging because we collect organizations from different sources and they tend to use different IDs, okay? So the commission use PIC IDs. And since we are serving the commission, we have to keep the PIC IDs. When we collect organizations from uh, Open Door, for example, they have their own understanding of what our organization is. And the same holds for other sources, uh, for all funders in general. Every funder has organizations inside and they have their own understanding. So we had to, de uh, to deal with the duplication of organization. And that's pretty, um, uh, hard to do. So what we did uh, is to, and we are doing it in this very moment. So today, if you go to the website, you will find uh, a deduplication, right? So, and the deduplication is not necessarily uh, correct all the time, but the hardest part is that it's not stable. So every time we run again, the duplication, this may vary, right? So what we're building today is a database that stabilizes the results of uh, uh, this uh, the duplication. So we store somewhere the results of the duplication and we curate them. And then this database, uh, the say the, the say the um, validated part is included again in the duplication and always wins, right? So we can only enrich it, and we have a number of curators, uh, namely the nodes. We'll actually give them an account so they can work at the national level to fix actually to uh, cross bridge different IDs. So ISNI is already there because it's part of uh, GRID, uh, Ringgold as well. And they will be able to bridge it to PIC IDs, to uh, uh, open door IDs and so on. And this database of course will be public. So anybody can access it and take advantage of it. The format in the date is uh, the format in open air. Well, we expose it today in different ways from ranging from XML to JSON and it obeys to a data model. And this data model can vary depending on the, the formats and is always available. For example, we export uh, the links, uh, Skull Explorer as a JSON that obeys to the Skullix format, which is a, a format uh, defined uh, in uh, RDA uh, for the exchange of links. Uh, and when we export, the full XML of um, OpenAir, uh, this XML obeys to a metadata format that is, uh, of course, made available and described together with the collection. Well, we also have linked open data. Think open data is available, but it's a subset for the moment of the graph. Uh, 
and uh, will make available the whole set thanks to uh, work that is being done uh, in Athens, which is the University of Athens, uh, um, to um, uh, provide a scalable technology for linked open data. Because you may understand that a graph with uh, what we have today, almost 200 million objects expanded uh, in linked open data can be quite compelling. There is already. We already have uh, the Spark QL endpoint, so you can go to lod.openair.eu. And as I mentioned, this is only a subset for the moment because Virtuoso doesn't scale up to our numbers. But again, uh, Maria, we are trying to do better. So we are actually developing technologies to make this available, fully available as linked open data. Okay, so thank you, thank you all, really. It's really important that you uh, showed up today and you had all these questions and really keep on asking questions and uh, send us your complaints, send us, uh, send us all your doubts uh, because it's actually very important. We want this to be uh, uh, ours, <laughs> I mean, in the sense of all of us, including you, okay? <laughs> 